Okay, turn 49. The war is on. Pelagia has attacked its enemies. Um, events list first, then we'll go over the map. So we received a whole bunch of items from our colleagues. Uh, this is what I need to start gearing up a combination of... Uh, this is for mages. The Great Sword of Sharpness from Pangea is for a thug that we're building. Elemental Mastery is for a very important spell we're going to cast in the near future. Mainly Vengeful Water. That's the extra water boost that we need to get one of our... Um, one of our cap only mega sacreds up to the requisite level. A couple armor of knights because they're just very useful in general for things like liches that are very resistant except for the fact they have no armor. Uh, shield, useful. We've got evocation 6 which means we're going to have wailing winds. We've empowered pocket frontline in air. And then we've done a few more awakenings which come into the army. So um, the sleeper we'll talk about when we talk about the army, but this is a very, very good commander. It's an attempt to boost my morale levels among all my frontline infantry to make it less likely for them to run off uh, the battle early from being hit by a couple of spells, or if our enemy happens to have like Wailing Winds or anything like that as well. Pale Riders for a little bit of chaff. The Dome of Arcane Warding happened. Uh, we didn't lure anyone to the sea. We got the one random, we got the one random siren, but there it is. Um, okay, so first. And most hilariously, the Battle of Umbul. This is the Throne Province. And I just sent in one guy. Spend gems on me, I'm scary. The Ictid Pearl Mage. Who is carrying a water bracelet and two water gems. And whose job was hopefully to one scout and two trigger gem use from whatever big holy ambush I was expecting to be waiting for me. There wasn't. There was just some PD. So spend gems on me, I'm scary. Body etherealized and then made a water elemental. The Water Elemental is now fighting a bunch of PD that is in darkness. That is attack skill 5, defense skill 8 is the Brutian Militia stats uh, in the dark because of that lovely negative 3 penalty. The Elemental is 14-14. And our mage is unlikely to get head capped by an arrow because he is body etherealized. So the chance of the kit going through, obviously minimized. And so it begins. Three kills in the first stab. Water Elemental takes a little bit of damage, but it's still size 6. Munch. Most of the Bridian units are routed at this point. Munch. And the archers stand their ground until they all get eaten by that Water Elemental, which then murders the commander of the PD. So in Umbor... Spend gems on me, I'm scary, has captured the province and placed the fortress under siege. Fantastic. We didn't see much resistance, if any, in Tien and Oog, where we went off to the side. Just a couple of mages, troops, to, as I said, open up the province, reduce our supply burden, etc. We sent a single lich. Uh, his gem use is not going to be triggered, neither is uh, the water gem usage on the pearl mage. The troops will just be able to cut their way through. Um, this is one, that was like one PD, I'm pretty sure, so we lost one turtle warrior. Um, the province is not breached, but um, it is taken, which is handy. Very, very, very handy. And now we have pretty much everything in position in Moss Woods. Tinanog is um, taken. In order to reduce the risk of reinforcements coming in that we weren't aware of, Atlantis seized Frosted Peaks with just a very small raiding force, and Varnheim uh, took Dragon Scale Mountains, which means there's just this 185 through which they can send reinforcements. But 185 is a forest, not a plain, so movement cost is higher relative to moving from either of these um, fortresses across planes. So if they had anything that was fast moving, I don't think they do, but if they did, this would cut them off. We don't know, because this wasn't a teleport attack, we don't know if the Dracon made it into the fort before um, it was placed under siege. I'm assuming yes. I'm assuming that the Dracon is inside that fort. Let's go around and have a look at other happenings. In Aldgold's First of all, Atlantis assassinated a Bridian Sage with their random event assassin. Nifty. Then they moved this army in, which has a couple of geared Basalt Kings, a Basalt Queen to bless every, to bless them, and then a bunch of troops. They are on this fort. It's about what they could do within the supply limitation. They have breached that fortification, I believe. Um, 
and we'll be assaulting it relatively shortly and that will cut this umbilical that we were talking about. This is actually two armies. This is both the army of Atlantis, well, an army of Atlantis, and an army of Therados. And double stacking these armies is an interesting thing tactically. Um, I'll talk about it briefly now, but we can really examine this. If ever, we ever talk about disciples' battle strategy, stacking the two armies on top of each other means that it the enemy doesn't know exactly what sort of force they'll be facing if they drop onto that army or if they fight that army. So you, whatever was fighting this has to be key to defeat the Therodian army and the Atlantean force, and they are very, very different armies. They can't fight together, they can't combine on the same battlefield, but they can, they both fight sequentially if the province is attacked, so this is handy. Also, um, Supply usage for the Throdian army is massively negative because of all of the nature majors with the army, so it doesn't take up any supply sitting alongside Atlantean um, Atlantean units at the same time, um, which I think is a mixture of coral guards and uh, basalt kings. We can see that Hinnom has besieged Old Woods, good Old Woods at 48. They have besieged Agaria at 43. There is a big Baritian army in their capital, but the, at, in Endless Plain, the army of Hinnom, the line infantry, the Dawn Guards, etc., are coming forward to reinforce their uh, Melkart SCs, and all is well as far as that's concerned. There'll probably be a climactic battle either there or here. Um, I'm not sure if they'll defend 43 by preference, or they'll try and fight us as we move up to Beratos itself, liquidating Beratos. Um, I can't actually imagine the economy of the of Team Chris is actually in great shape right now. Um, Machaka is quite small. I mean, it's got a couple of holdings down here, but for the most part, Machaka is they are they are in on this rush. They are really in on this rush. Beratos has been massively reduced. It's a couple of provinces. It's one, two, three unseaged provinces. That's how quickly it has been. Um, it has been collapsed by Hinnom, and now these movements and the random event. Agatha, however, is still very large. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, maybe 17, 18. Like, Agatha is a reasonable size. I mean, their second cap, Arcosophali, is under siege. Their third cap, Tinanog, is under siege. Agatha itself is not under siege. It's safe and secure. Um, Niflheim secured 34. And then at 51, the throne. I believe the fortification is breached and it's going to come down to a big fight. Um, I've talked to Pangea about this. And I believe the gamble move, which does risk their bless as a team, which as you remember is regeneration, it's a big bless, is um, teleporting the pretender god, the statue, inside that fort in order to give them some unexpected heavy staying power against whatever storms. Because there was no statue or SC in there when they went in, maybe the Machakan forces will not be geared to deal with a giant, very high protection, mega buffed statue um, turn timering them. So that's one way to maybe hold 51, um, which would be ideal. Now the timing, if things go badly, is considering that they still hold 128. The worst possible timing is GC attacks 128 and loses. Uh, Machaka seizes 51. That means all they need to do is claim 51 to win. But if we breach 194 next turn, the same turn they have seized 51, then we get to storm 194 the same turn they claim 51. And the game only checks for a throne victory as the very last resolution point. So if they claim the throne they need to win, even though it happens early in the turn resolution order, but later in the resolution order they lose a throne to a storming here, they still lose the game. No, well, they don't lose the game. They don't win the game. So that is just enough time. Just enough. And we moved on to 191 here. Uh, do we face anything? No, not really. Okay. So what's going to happen now? This army at 191 is going to try and basically secure the flank of this throne. We're not going to go marching off towards 168. That's greedy. We're not allowed to take enough thrones to win anyway. 
Agatha is right here, so you can bet that reinforcements can just do this little walk. So we're going to take this army and we're going to try and seize 196 because there's a bunch of Magi being recruited there, which means it's a good province and it's on the flank of 194. I don't like having enemy labs close to fronts like this. So let's go, let's go take it, reduce it, and build up our little perimeter around here. And then just about everything from these armies is going to combine onto 194, while Theridos attacks Beratos at 38. What is this attack going to look like? Okay, so the fundamental problem here is that there's a couple of threats that can be thrown at us. The first is some sort of battlefield wipe trap straight out of the gate. So if the super combatant, instead of self-buffing, goes into an earthquake cycle. As a result, what you'll notice, um, this was geared up for this was geared for if he dropped on me this turn, and I wasn't as worried about this. What I'm going to do is create scripts. I've labeled most of my mages, by the way. S is slave. Um, instead of going straight into a slave script, a lot of mages, particularly the masters and the juniors, I'm going to work it out. Are going to have are going to be set up so they are guaranteed to get at least one protection spell up before earthquake can drop. That might be body ethereal. It might be moss body for the nature for the nature water mages. Okay, the god is stay, going to stay home and cast crumble. Then the communion is going to move on, geared to fight a potential patrolling super combatant. Um, I'll take you through that script once you see it, so it's a little bit of a surprise. But suffice to say, we're going to get some uh, liches geared up. We're going to have um, we're going to have Wailing Winds. We're going to have Life After Death. Life After Death is another way to protect yourself from wipes. It's just it's a bit slow getting up. Um, we're going to have some big nature, so we're going to have things like Relief going up, which is going to be really handy. Um, we're actually going to be able to boost all the way up to uh, Fog Warriors, I believe. We're going to boost all the way up to Fog Warriors with our limited Air Mages because we will have that many slaves. Um, if they fight us, they'll they'll burn a lot of gems. They'll see a script. What I'm going to do now is load up enough gems. I've already started, as you can see. Um, so many gems that we can run our script. I think my goal is four or five times successfully. Um, and I have the gems to do that. I have the gems, except for in death, where I won't have enough runs. I might even alchemize a couple of extra death gems so I have enough to run the script at least three or four times to account for potential gem baiting. Now, it'll be hard to gem bait us in Moss Woods because the Dome of Arcane Warding is up. It's impossible. It would be impossible to do it at TNN in 201. So we should arrive with most of our gems intact, in which case the number of battles we might fight is a Sally battle this turn, a Sally battle next turn, and a Storming the Fort next turn, and maybe one extra if Machaka is able to teleport something on top of the fort. Or move something or infiltrate something. So maybe four battles, possibly as high as five, but I expect the magic number is going to be two or three, depending on the strategy they adopt. But there we are. We have uh, 317 Siege Strength in that army. We have 142 Siege Strength in that army. And then Crumble will do its damage as well. We should do. We should hurt them. We should hurt them. These armies are still very flimsy because most of the mages are little human HP things. I mean, at least Ictiads are 15, but the slave mages, not slave mages, the Pelagian Explorers are only 10. And then all of our troops are little fragile 10 hit point, 10 protection sort of things. But we're making our mark. And if things go badly down here, we in Pelagia will be the last great hope. Look, th this is not what we were <laughs> expecting uh, this game. But we did know that we wanted to be funny and a nuisance in the late game. But, you know, I'll take I'll take World Saving Hero. If it turns out that um, we sacrifice tens of thousands of Turtle Warriors in order to save the world for a couple more turns, I think that's, I think that's a win for Pelagia. So there we are. That's turn 49. We'll go to turn 50 next. What's going to happen is I'm going to move on to 194 and either will be the setup for the climactic fight or it will be the climactic fight. Either way, see you in turn 50. All right, turn 50 in the real tragedy. Sparkles is dead. 
after 50 turns. Many of which uh, Sparkle spent as the sole raiding, uh, sole raiding entity belonging to Lanka. Still raising hell behind the, behind the lines up until the very end. Sparkles has finally been vanquished and ascended into our pantheon as an honoured foe. Let's cut to the chase. Um, they sent out one gem baiting mage. Um, which didn't actually gem bait because it had no gems or items. I think this was instead just gave them a good pic. That wasn't a gem bait then. It just gave them a picture of my army setup. Which is... Looks very impressive, except for the fact that my army is actually not huge. Um, but it won't give him an idea of my script, because none of my spells would have been cast. So there you go. He gets to see what I have, but he doesn't get to see what my intention is to cast. Okay, so, what happened? Starshine Skullcap... Yep, good. Um, so we're gonna you're gonna see some mine hunt action soon, by the way. Twelve death gems, which we desperately asked for. They've claimed the subterranean waters, which is because the Agathan Mega Stack demolished the Rushian force. Absolutely like, there were losses. Um, by accounts there were losses, but the Rushians moved in. And the Agathans, this time, instead of retreating, stood their ground and claimed the throne. And it was a bit of a slaughter. Um, the Rushian bears cut down. The Agathan army has a whole bunch of magical support and then a whole bunch of very tough units in it. So they've got magma children and umbrals and penumbrals that have layered buff protection on them while some really mean spells go off in the background. And it looks like at 128, that throne is real. But, 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 at 51, Pangea held. Pangea held because their teleport, they teleported in their statue, and then in a mosh pit that included some mega-blessed pans, the statue itself, and a whole bunch of very um, capable enemy units. I have a screenshot um, I might not be able to put it up this episode, but I'll include it in the future. Um, and I'll make a note to remember that. They stood their ground in the gate for ages. Absolutely ages. It was apparently madness. Tremendous casualties. And then eventually the whole thing went to turn timer because the statue stood its ground. Um, and we're not sure what in Machaka. Pangea is still trying to work out what in Machaka triggered it to go all the way, like what was still on the field, like maybe there were some wolves or something, who knows. Um, it's not obvious from the replay, but eventually it goes to turn timer. Uh, which means Pangea wins. It's sure things die, but uh, Pangea wins. And the fortress is now unbroken. Reinforcements have come back, so Niflheim is positioned at 46. So the big, the big dumb frost giants that everyone loves... Uh, who everyone has questioned the strategy of can come back and hopefully occupy Berman Heights again. So the game is not going to be over. It's not over even if we fail at 194, unless um, Agatha manages to come up with some alternative way to win the game, uh, which we don't think they will. Um, nonetheless, we have crumbled Umbor and we have to go in because we are obliged to make maximum efforts and it's better to rip the band-aid off at some point, so we're going to. We're scripted um, now, as I discussed, with our body ethereal slave script to protect everything on round one. So it's a mixture of, we've got twist fates. Uh, lights, camera, and action are three master, master users that will get up. Light of the Northern Star, anti-magic, and will of the fates, as well as power of the spheres. I might reconfigure who does power of the spheres, but I want will of the fates to come a little bit later um, because it's not much protection super early and pr getting power of the spheres in means that there's a little bit less fatigue uh, and there will be a lot of fatigue from casting will of the fates. Got a bunch of water elemental casters to give us... Um, some things that can beat down the really tough enemy units and possibly even damage the Dracon just a bit. 
um, that we're expecting. So a bunch of super buffed water elementals might be able to do some damage. Uh, we've got a bunch of mages that'll be doing maybe one swarm in some cases and then be using things like frozen heart if they don't have enough cold resistance. So there's a lot of that. So there's some creeping doom. There's a big salt, there's going to be a big, um, there will be a big, I'm going to reconfigure some of the masters. There will be a big soul slay communion in there as well, which is not entirely done. This is about 40% done. Um, so we'll have a big soul slay and also some disintegrate castings with advanced and cast. So just, this thing's going to have like 27 MR, right? So it, it's going to ping off, it might ping 100 soul slays off it. But if I can cast 200 soul slays, 300 soul slays, maybe I'll get somewhere. And those are the sort of numbers we're looking at. Everything else is designed to keep the army in the field. Uh, so we're going to get elemental fortitude on all of the communion slaves. And we're going to get fog warriors. Mass regeneration. Uh, there will also, there's a relief caster in there somewhere. I'll write reconfigure one of the other mages to be a relief caster. So we should have relief, we should have mass regeneration, we should have poison resistance, we should have body ethereal, we should have life after death, um, we should have wailing winds, all sorts of good stuff. And most of the troops are led by the sleeper or the bane lord which gives them plus three morale, which means that a lot of these people are sitting on really nice high morale checks. 14 rather than what they would be, which is like 11. And my veteran, some of my veteran turtle warriors, if I can find some of them, are even higher. Oh no, he's wounded. Anyway, there are some veteran turtle warriors in here that I think have 15 morale, which is, which is kind of nifty. The ones that have been there since the start. So that's what I'm going to be doing. Let's talk about what went badly. So this this army is much less supported by mag magic. And it turns out it wasn't just a mage army. There are several geared and ready mages here. So there was a spider clan sorcerer who, for some reason, had body of twisting thorns. Oh, nature four. Okay, so we've got an N4. And then we've got a couple of booters, including a booter with E4 and gems. And we're about to see what mages can do to an army that isn't prepared to fight. We've got a bunch of bug problems. The idea was I thought the bugs would break up the uh, castle cycle. Alas, we were not so lucky. I was hoping the bugs would achieve more than they actually did. The original frontline conflict goes on. Don't worry about the frontline conflict. This is what changes past came. They get a fire elemental up that starts really clearing the bugs. You see what's going to happen now. There's enough spammy magic left to hold this front line between the skeletons, the last few troops, and the fire elemental, and my troops, with victory probably in sight, because you can see we're starting to cut our way through. Flee. It didn't have to go that way. They were even stabbing one of the were hyenas at the point that they ran. Now, casualties aren't awful. Basically, nothing died on the retreat. Uh, the Lich died, but the Lich will just respawn in a couple of terms. We lost the Pelagian Captain, no other mages, 24 Turtle Warriors, 4 Kenids. We didn't kill anything. That said, I kind of know what was going on, and we were horrendously... like We weren't lucky in how that played out. So I'm just going to group my stuff back together, all, everything that fled, um, boot up with a couple of gems, adjust my scripting, and go back in. We need to get a... We expect to get a Bloody Nose, that's fine. Uh, what's happening down here? Atlantis with the raiding. Love it. Deep, deep, deep raiding. Uh, over on the Beritian front, we split up. So, Therados moved in against the province of Beritos itself. Let's have a look at the Therodian army. So, we have a Telkine, geared. So, Girdle of Might, regen, boots of stone. So, it's 29 protection off the bat, armor of knights. Spirit Helm, Lead Shield, Firebrand, 
you're like, but why stone skin if you can iron skin yourself? Um, well, because it saves you a point of casting on the script. And he had some boots of stone. Bunch of mages, including a couple of Hakatarides. Uh, nature gems for them are coming in. But, uh, he didn't need them for this initial battle. Because they can always protect themselves from poison, which is what they're doing. And then this big old army of guys. Remember, Theridos in this game doesn't spawn ghosts. He's not pop kill. He's not he's not getting free spawn ghosts. He has like a billion E4s that he has accumulated slowly over the course of the game, and they are artisanally handcrafting the ghosts that go into his field army. So Theridos doesn't have that many ghosts. But he has enough to be like almost top army size because he has now got this very slow, very inefficient, but quite good quality chaff manufacturing line going on. That between that and his uh, his contracts to produce his devils, he's actually producing a medium army. Uh, Atlantis moved out this way onto 25 and also onto 32, which is good. Now these forces are going to starve and need to get out of these positions now, but one turn of starvation is not too bad. And we've found these wasteland, well wasteland and hills province. Wasteland has more supplies than uh, the hills. That's bizarre. Anyway, Sunridge, Waterfield Cave, Arena, Cave of Clouds, Witch's Bog. Lots of gems here. Fantastic. And then down here, lots of gems. These provinces that we are seizing are fantastic. Hidden gem mine, 100 gold per turn, 75 gold per turn, 40 resources. Look at this. So I don't care if it's turn 50 and people forget about the economy. Don't forget about the economy at turn 50. Don't. This is amazing. And if you look at the gem income for Atlantis, look at what Beratos was sitting on. We haven't taken much. Meanwhile, stormed the breach fortress. So this is a good example of how to, you know, Breach versus clear. Used a giant army to breach the fortress and then sent in um, a basalt king. Armor of Knights, Spirit Helm, Vine Shield, Firebrand, Ring of Regen, Regen 10. This does mean I don't think this one will even be blessed. But it doesn't really matter. So it's now Protection 31, Regen 10, and it's Blunt, blunt Shock, uh, Blunt Stab. Resistant. Basically, it's an ordinary weapon resistant and manically high protection. Got a little bit of reinvigoration, four reinvigoration on it, so it's not exactly fatigue neutral, but if it falls asleep, it'll wake up again pretty quickly. And now it just needs to work its way through the summons, which it will be able to do. Thanks in no small part due to the effect of the Spirit Helm taking advantage of things. He'll stab the mage to death, and that's all she wrote. So, we've secured this fort, we've sliced this umbilical in two. It looks like Hinom lost a fight on Agaria, but they have still got their super combatants that have retreated to Old Woods, and they've got reinforcement troops, but they don't have Agaria. So Beratos must have moved the capital forces off their capital in order to hold the throne, which I think, given the circumstances and the fact they were playing for win, absolutely the right call. Now the question is, Will they move back onto Beratos in order to defend it, or will they bunker up on the throne? Those are probably their two realistic options. Team GC is now in an interesting position. Um, Niflheim is absolutely in a position to counterattack Machaka and occupy a bunch of their territory. I'm going to hire a bunch of mercenaries in 10 just to raid some of this uh, stuff. Well, specifically this stuff up here. Um, if Atlantis isn't able to do it. But this is Niflheim territory now. It's just a matter of time. Pangaea will be able to bring more things over and reinforce. I think the Machakan capital is threatened in the medium term. But up in Rus, Agartha is still a problem. Agartha is stronger than Rus. 
their army is difficult to beat. The only saving grace for Rus is that the Agarthan army is probably anchored to this throne. The other option is the Agarthans try and split, send this army back, and fight me. Which would be not ideal, but um, it's an option available to them. I think they might want to anchor on this throne, but if they decide they can't win the game off a throne rush now, they might decide to consolidate. And consolidation would mean pulling back, pushing me into the sea, capturing these raided territories, and turning this zone into Feshtung Agatha, I think. But that's in the future. I really should be focused right now on this. And I am. It's just, it scares me, so I don't talk about it too much. Basically, the setup is we're going to have a bunch of spells to make ourselves as survival as possible. We're going to put up Wailing Winds. We're going to have a billion Soul Slays. And we're going to try and kill the Super Combatant. If we can't kill the Super Combatant, we're going to rout the Super Combatant. We are going to burn our Communion. I did the numbers. I think I have to. To get to a high enough level to cast the spells I want, I need to burn the Communion. And there's no way to guarantee ending the battle soon enough that the Communion doesn't get burnt unless one of the Soul Slays works. So, there is about a 50% chance more. There is about a 70% chance, I'm, I'm guessing, that we burn out probably um, a reasonable chunk of our Communion, even with Mass Regen going on, because we have so many Masters. Um, that's just going to have to be the way it is. But if we can seize 194, we won't lose it again. I don't think. Because we'll be able to turn all the defensive advantages of this site to our advantage. So, wish me luck. Next turn, we storm the cave fort and see if we're ready to take on this dragon. See you then. Alright, let's start with the big one. Here we are. This is our army. This is their army. I don't even mean this stuff. This is their army. This is Snek. Snek has 28 magic resistance. A crown of lead. So, crown of lead, mistletoe garland. So, he's got poison resistance 29 and luck. He has 10 base regeneration, 10 bless regeneration, because he is auto blessed, and he will soon have. 30% regeneration because he will no doubt cast like Strength of Gaia probably and go up to 30% regeneration. He has good skills and a whole suite of buffs that he can cast. It appears there is also one extra mage here. Might be fluffing, who knows. This is our army. In the front, the Water Elemental and, Swar and uh, Creeping Doom casters, as well as the guys that will eventually be the Disintegrate Casters. In the center, it's Communion Slave City. They are in clusters. They are in clusters because it means that one or two uh, mages in that square casting Body Ethereal give very good odds of hitting all three. And that allows a different mage in the square to do something else with his turn one. So I've clustered my mages into groups of three for maximum protection, and you've seen that happens pretty much everywhere. There's a few places it's not perfect, but for the most part, where the buffs are not individual, so like the Nature Mage is a casting Moss Body, which is individual, so that's that. One sec. Alright, sorry about that. But yes, clustering mages into these groups of three means the AoE one-point buffs do their thing. So, here's what's going to happen in this battle, already looking at it. There's nowhere near as much stuff in here as I feared, which is unfortunate because the ability to route off the uh, Dracon early is probably not going to be there. We're going to throw up a huge number of buffs, which are going to make our units have immense staying power, and we're going to put out some summons. We're going to wipe the floor with the units. And then the question is going to become, before we go off script, can we kill the Dracon? Because once we go off script... Um, because of the way fatigue calculations work, um, we're likely going to be mixing in Paralyze with our Mind Burn, Soul Slays, Disintegrates, etc. So we're not going to have as many check or die spells against it. If we don't, are we going to be able to chip the Dracon down? And if we can't chip the Dracon down, 
can we outlast it to the point where it flees off the field first? That's what's going to happen here. And if so, what are the casualties other than the <laughs> So, body ethereals. Sorry, I shouldn't be dying so fast there. Body ethereals protect everything, all the mages. So all the mages are going to be moss bodied or they're going to have protection buffs or they're going to be etherealized. You can see the, uh, the thug in the back has had that done to them. Um, the mages are all protected at this point to varying extent and the communion is starting to fire up. Summons are going out. Summons are going out first before all the buffs go down. The buffs have gone down, so what have we got so far? We've got mass regen is out. Wailing is up. The Snack has cast uh, Howl. Now, Howl is one of the reasons why they had all those troops. They're going to go off. They're going to protect the mages from the wolves. We are now Fog Warrior up. And I don't think we've been able to kill Snack. That's okay, and Snack will now try and complete Snack's buff cycle. And there's going to be questions how we kill it any other way. Army's gone. Snack's morale. Morale 30. Uh -huh. Okay, so. Yeah. So now the question is, do we have enough damage from anywhere to actually ship through Snack's. To ship through Snack? And the answer is probably not enough. And also, Snack runs out of ammunition for his dragon gas, and we'll just be fighting people. And the fight's not actually that effective. Not in this context, anyway, because you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 attacks, and the tail sweep is AoE 1. Sure, but you're up against units that have. Uh, in some cases, decent prot, decent defense. They're lucky, which means you need to kill them four times on average for it to actually kill them. And you have ethereal, which means they're very hard to hit with non-magical weapons. And snake attacks are non-magical. So if you need to beat ethereal, you need to uh, cancel that fog warriors, and you need to get through like, it's it's really tough. And then mass regeneration and resistance So Snack is still holding his hit points because he's got 30% regeneration. We've inflicted chest wound, limp, and cripple. And keep racking up the uh, keep racking up the some pretty high fatigue counts. Snake's also running pretty high fatigue counts, and Snake has now lost an eye, is weakened, limped, crippled, never healing, wheel, wound, and mute. Let me just check something. Let's keep going. Poor Snake is getting way along. Okay, so there goes our round. We've routed. Under the other way. So now the question is, um, will we, everything of ours get off the field before Snack routes and Snack gets off the field? We've got some very fatigued Ichtyid Pearl Mages here. They've routed, but at 196 fatigue, they're not going anywhere. Nor 
of these wolves going to succeed in killing them? Because they're etherealized, they're lucky, they got reasonable protection, they're moss-bodied. Um, wolves aren't going to be able to kill them, even passed out. Okay, snake has routed. And snake's gone. With snake gone, it will just be the wolves. The wolves are not poison resistant. The wolves will all die to poison. Orders to our troops. There's no poison over here, the dracons are gone. And these last horribly, horrifically wounded turtle warriors that were trying to get off the field. Okay, so. Huge number of retreats. And I think most of them. Yeah, so. Here's the nifty thing about taking a fortification. But first, I'll let me give myself the moment here. Um, we won. We burned. We burned our communion as expected. We lost one explorer, so we burnt 15 cap only mages. We burnt 41 mercenary foulspawns. Don't care. Mercenary. Don't care. 23 keenids. Eh. Uh, 10, one casting of long dead horsemen. And four turtle warriors. See, the turtle warriors did work killing all the wolves and the chaff, but at the end of the day, um, it was just being able to gunk up the field, and most importantly, the job of all those mages, and the reason that that communion died and gave its life, is to put so many buffs on our units that they would survive two-turn timer the Dracon, which they did. Um, this could have been avoided if we were confident that this was all that was here. But if there was more, then this was necessary, and there, there was no reason, sorry, there was reason, I made the call that it was worth burning the communion, going in, in order to have the buffs necessary to take whatever came. Well, we took whatever came, and what we took out was their Dracon. We gave it a huge number of injuries, we stripped away its... So, because it went in with no afflictions, and we sent it home with maximum afflictions. Um... The loss of the items they probably won't feel. This is a really cheap loadout. This is a 10, 20, 25 gem loadout. Plus 5 nature gems. Nature gems is nothing to spend on a battle like this. Certainly compared to the gems we dropped. We would have dropped far more than that, I think, across all of our spells. And we lost the mages. But we took the fort. We took the fort of Umbor. With it, we took the throne of life, which will give us three nature gems per turn. It'll give us an extra growth point. It'll be two dominion checks, which is important. We will put a temple here. We will claim it. We will preach it. And we will start pushing our vengeful water dominion right out. That's right. I said vengeful water. We'll talk about that in a moment. So Umbor, we succeeded. There were some other battles. Uh, this didn't matter. This was just a bump. Atlantis raiding Agartha. This time Agartha did a little bit of a PD dump here, and as a result, this little small force got defeated. Vanheim raiding Machaka. Uh, this is us doing a tiny little move, and unfortunately, we crossed swords with Vanheim and got murdered. That's okay. Machaka attacked Atlantis and won with a little bit of a raiding force of their own, even when they're on the defense. We raided Beratos. Him being discovered and attacked. Atlantis clearing out uh, Bogus's colleagues using three Basalt Kings. That's funny. So, in the right-hand corner, we have Bogus the Troll Leader, we have the Griffin, and we have the Troll Mage. These people who have caused many troubles for many people. And over here, we have three geared Basalt Kings. some of whom are cowards, evidently. Anyway. Despite that looking bad, they did win. Um, so, there you go. Um, that was Gnumia, that was the border. Okay, great, fantastic. Now, there are other things we did this turn. The biggest one 
was Anigros has cast Vengeful Water. This is what the Elemental Mastery staff was for. So Robe of the Sea, Water Bracelet, Elemental Mastery equals W7 on a Recruitable Mage. Not bad, eh? Um, now, I didn't want to prioritize Vengeful Waters. I didn't. But my teammates prevailed upon me to put it up sooner rather than later because they were worried that we would be targeted and we couldn't predict exactly when we would be targeted. Well, Vengeful Water claimed a couple of victims. Over here, Beratos launched an airdrop Thug SC Gate Cleaver offensive against the fort at Andoria. It's uh, a mixture of milk hearts and brides in waiting. I don't think we'll get to see it. No, it's just hit on being discovered. Um, here. One of those mages. A bride in waiting. With 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 fire gems and a gate cleaver. Triggered the vengeful water. And got wrecked. Because, as a coastal province, size 6. That is the difference. I, well, first of all, we've killed a major mage and the gem reloads that they were carrying. There were 25 fire gem loads on that force. And those are dead. And a gate cleaver is dead. And as a result of that gate cleaver being dead, the fortress is not breached, which means we've got time, exactly one turn more than we would otherwise, to move a Therodian reinforcing army to knock them off Andoria. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to target that province with a spell I would normally never use. Fires from afar. So this can do up to 10 hits on targets in a province and it does 15 armor-piercing fire damage. That's normally a terrible spell because most of what you hit and kill will be troops. Here there's only 5 targets. And that damage might kill 1 or 2 geared brides in waiting. Now, you might be like, well, you guys don't have any mages that can cast that. Well, it just so happens that lying around... Theridos has some recruitable elite fire mages that they have gotten, and they've built boosters for, so they just happen to have on hand the ability to throw some fire spells and maybe kill some units in Andoria as well. So, this could have been a great Hail Mary by the Bridian team, because winning this battle, if they had been able to hold us here, if they had breached this fort, and being able to assault this fort, then by the time we move back onto it, they will have they will, might have claimed one. They essentially would have swapped 31 for 194. But it was not to be. We now have the ability to stop this because um, they'll be taking checks at eight Dominion Candles against Vengeful Water for each of their mages. And Vengeful Water is probably good enough to kill the Brides in Waiting. Definitely won't kill the Melkars, but we might kill the Brides in Waiting or anything else that's there. Uh, in addition to that, we might kill some of the smaller units with the remote attacks, and we have time to bring an army in. And we have the time to teleport some stuff inside the fort. All in all, we're in very good shape because Phaonix prevailed upon me with Stalin to get Vengeful Water up a turn earlier than I probably would have otherwise. All good. All, all, all good. Um, reassembling here, going to move on to Droigar. But really, the real win here is we won 194. Um, pulling together reinforcements is going to take a bit. Um, like, that's harsh. We burnt out our communion. But we can make do. We can shrink the overall communion size so we have room for slaves and masters. We can recruit more units and bring them together. Uh, we do have some reserves of um, 
astral guys. We've got a couple over here. There'll be a couple over here. So we can pull together more slaves if we need them. Uh, we're certainly going to recruit a few more in the capital now that we don't need more of the uh, recruitable Holy Threes. One of these will then come in and be able to claim the throne. With some astral boosters, you can teleport Pearl Kings. Uh, Pearl Kings can get up to that Astral 3 that you need to teleport them. Just make sure they have something that allows them to live on land. And they can go around and even though you don't have what you would normally think of as a recruitable Priest 3, you do actually have a cap-only Priest 3. It's just an extremely expensive mage chassis that you normally would not recruit. So, yeah, fantastic. Fantastic all around. Um, other battles. We moved on to Agaria. As you saw, uh, the fortress is not breached. Atlantis has more troops nearby that can uh, move on to 48. Meanwhile, Theratos has breached Beratos. Now, there's a talk. There was thinking between moving Theratos onto the throne immediately. I don't. We don't think there's any more that pressure to immediately take the throne. So we're actually going to liquidate the Bridian capital. Um, the capital, which is not in great shape population and unrest-wise, but we're going to take it nonetheless because it will be good and useful. And it will also basically destroy Beratos uh, as a power, which is all good. We can see over here our, our good friends, uh, the Enkidu, have moved as far as 166, which is great. So their plan was always to come in and threaten 168, Eternal Expanse. We're giving them some information. Um, I'm not... Hugely confident in their army builds, but Foxy is an absolute boss. Uh, quite a new a new player to Dominions, but really just a pleasure to work with. So I'm hoping the Enki do do well out here. For the moment, we've secured our part of the world, and I don't have a huge amount of appetite to go marching out to war. And Agatha, it seems, was keen just to hold on to 128, and I expect they may stay there until they fall afforded it. We'll see. Certainly, there's nothing getting into 51 anymore. Niflheim has moved in, and they are there to stay. And I expect that uh, the good old green machine over here in Pangaea will soon have resurrected their god, and they'll have their bless back. So, at this point, I think it's fair to say the rush has failed. They've lost this throne. They won't take this throne. In order to win... They need to not lose this one and take this one. And I think we can handle this. The Melkart super combatants are scary, and I would have trouble with super combatants. We just saw me have trouble with super combatants. But Therados won't. Therados can fight Melkarts with Telkines. They can um, fight fire with fire, and they can bring chaff, and they have devils and a bunch of units that are actually decent in Thug and SC fights. They'll have gem reloads, they have resources, they can cast remotes. They're just in a much better shape. And not having Andoria breach this turn makes all the difference in the world. So, because of some clutch defensive water magic, because of what was basically a human wave assault on an enemy um, pretender chassis, and because of the noble defensive efforts of Pangaea, and uh, to an extent, Niflheim. I think the rush has been stopped. I'm not sure who will win this game, but it's unlikely to be Team Chris at this point. We have a treaty. That treaty compels us all to clean up Team Chris, and then people can start cancelling out of the treaty, or at least the cancellation period is shorter. They can try to cancel before that. It's just a very long period of time, and... Uh, that's a, a six-turn notice if they go early. So hopefully what will happen now is people will roll back the Machakans, Brutians, uh, and Agarthans, wipe them off the map, look at the new borders, and then we'll play the diplomatic and military game to see who, out of the remaining alliances of Team Underwater Bastards, uh, Team Ice Babies, and I'm not sure what the cool name for Team... Hinom, Saramacia, um, and our lovely nation of Enkidu, played by Foxy over here, is. But they are cool nonetheless. Technically, the elves are also still in the game. It would actually warm my hearts to see uh, the elves somehow win it, but I just don't think they have the mass to, to make it happen. But, you know, we'll see. Anything can happen in the game of Dominions. You can get right up close. You can become within a turn or two of winning the game. And then if people pull it all together... 
defeat can be snatched from the jaws of victory. But for me and my fish, well, it feels sweet. Didn't know we had it in us. All right, guys. Thank you very much. See you next time.